Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session on disruptive technologies. I'm Nick Buckmaster, and I realised I probably need to give a couple of uh, conflicts of interest in that I happen to sit on the uh, a quality and safety advisory committee to the board of the Australian Digital Health Authority. And at the moment, I'm also the uh, senior responsible officer for the My Health Record implementation program within Queensland Health. What that will tell you is that I'm a technology tragic. And the reason I'm a technology tragic is that my father, a general surgeon in Albury, was a technology tragic, and he taught me that it's good fun to play computer games. But my father was a technology tragic because he also happened to buy the first, uh, sorry, the second gastroscope in Australia. And as a general surgeon, he went overseas to Japan to learn how to use flexible gastros gastroscopes and brought that back with him. And he started doing electronically formatted reports for gastroscopy and colonoscopy around about 30 years ago. Maybe not quite, 25. So I think technology is in my blood. But having said that, we are on the verge of a absolute revolution. In a very short period of time, how we are communicating is already changing. How hospitals work, areas which have always been pretty technological, are rapidly changing and what that means for all of us as physicians is that we are going to have to change how we work in order to provide good care for our patients. We heard this morning from Ian Scott about the personal experiences of the implementation of an electronic medical record and the associated technology stack in his hospital. But this afternoon, we're going to look at a very big picture view of how technology is going to change the way that health works. And we're going to see and hear about some examples about what is going to occur in our future in the next few years, which will change dramatically what we do and what society will expect us to do. I've got a few little housekeeping messages. One is, if you've got your personal technology device in your hospital switched with the sound on, please turn it off. Second one is, if we hear the technology go beep, 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 be alert but not alarmed. And if we hear the technology go whoop, 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 then we'll be guided to the appropriate exits. I also remind you that there is the Congress hashtag on hashtag RACP18, and I have seen that there has been active discussions occurring on that site. And a reminder that the Wi-Fi access is on the RACP Congress network, and the password, somewhat surprisingly, is RACP2018. And last but not least, if you haven't already downloaded the uh, app, then please do so, and the connection pass, the connection is your uh, email address that you use to register, and the password is RACP18, and it only took me three goes to realise it was 18 and not 2018. I would like to 
just tell you that unfortunately uh, our last speaker today w is unable to attend. So we are going to hear today from John Lambert, Leslie Burnett and Peter Cork. And that will be followed by a panel discussion with questions from the audience. During this session, please go to the app and put in questions that you would like to ask. We will have a microphone for questions, but I also will be watching the questions coming through on the app and will ask those questions, particularly those that are challenging and uh, entertaining of our panel at the end. So I'm just going to introduce to you now John Lambert. John has been the recent uh, Chief Clinical Information Officer for New South Wales Health. And in fact, that was the first time that we've had a doctor be a, cl a Chief Clinical Information Officer in Australia. And that's not what's on the... Uh, uh, I, I did warn him that I would ad lib a little. Um, He's an intensivist. He's been working in New South Wales Health for 25 years. He has recently commenced a new role as Chief Medical Officer for the ANZ Healthcare Division of DXC, which is a pretty large technology company. And I welcome John to our stage. So thank you for coming, John. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I'm just going to try and make sure I keep to time, so I'm just sort of self-servicing a, uh, a bit of a timer here. Uh, naturally doing it on the last fly, I suddenly realised that I wasn't going to be able to see my iPhone from where I was standing, so I needed a bigger screen. Most uh, technology whizzes like Nick and myself love bigger screen. Hello, everybody. I almost feel like I should give my talk from sort of where the sound desk is, but that'd be a bit mean for the sound desk and especially the camera guy, so I am going to talk from up on the stage like you're supposed to much as I hate conforming. Um, I will start by acknowledging uh, that we are speaking on Aboriginal land, pay my respects to Aboriginal elders, past, present and future, and also pay my respects to a number of people in the audience here who are my mentors and teachers uh, from quite some time ago. And um, you know who you are and thank you for helping create what I am today, which is a bit of a mess. Um, as you can see, I'm an anaesthetist intensivist. I'm sorry I wasn't one of those intensivists that came out of the physician flock. Um, and I've actually been doing technology for longer than I've been a doctor. I've been a technologist in one form or another for 30 years. And when I took on the role of the inaugural Chief Clinical Information Officer, um, poor fool them, um, I, I kind of valued it because I thought it was going to be a great opportunity to bring together the knowledge that I'd acquired in both of those fields and, and make a, a, a bigger and better difference to the world at large. So I don't know if I achieved that, but I left that role at the end of last year and as Nick has said, I'm about to start a new role on the dark side in, in the technology side of uh, industry. And please um, feel free to keep me honest anytime you want. My Twitter handle appears on every slide, uh, so you can always hassle me. So I'd like to start, you've all just been at a break, so you don't need to stand up. I'm not going to do one of those, but I think we need some upper body exercise. Um, so if you could raise your right hand if you have computers working in your practice today, in your private practices. Okay, I'm getting... Really? Only half of you? Or is it three quarters, two thirds, somewhere like that? Okay. Did I say put them down? I thought this is exercise. We need to strengthen those shoulders. Now put up the other hand if you have a wireless network in your practice that you'll let your patients use. Interesting. There's almost no exercise of the left hand. Okay. Um, you can choose which hand you uh, raise for the following questions. Um, how many of you use, those, uh, use a, an organized system, a, a specialized solution to do the billing for your practice? No, it's not as many names as I would have, hands as I would have thought. How about for appointment scheduling? Again, what do you think? Half, quarter? Please help me with the numbers if you think you can see them better. I've got all these lights in my face. I can't see quite as clearly. How many of you are using it in the room when you're consulting with patients? Okay, so it's sort of it's definitely less than a quarter. Uh, and how about using it to actually do everything? So documenting the patient notes, writing letters, prescribing, looking up dynamic patient-related information. I think I can see four hands, five, six, ten, fifteen maybe. Okay, we've got some work to do because there's not a lot of point having digital disruption if nobody's digital in the first place. And yet if I asked you to put up your left hand this time just to be different, 
left, right, whatever, your left. Um, if you have a smartphone or tablet somewhere near you right now, how many would put up your hands? Yeah, just about everybody. Fascinating. Um, I've got to find the clicker, which is here. So, disruption. What are we talking about? The disruption that I have been involved in for the last four years especially um, is about disruption that solves big problems by any measure. There's lots of people involved. They're nasty, gnarly problems that people haven't solved before. But the interesting thing is, they solve the problems of the people who are making the change. When we, um, I'll, I'll talk about the, that comment in a second. <laughs> and they, they generally solve problems, no, this is the right time, we didn't even realise we had. How many people thought in 2006 that we had a problem because we didn't have a high-powered computer with a high-fidelity screen and constant internet connection in our pockets. Nobody would have dreamed about that being a problem. Oh, hang on, there's one person who thought that was a problem. Okay, good. Well, you're obviously a futurist. Um, so, but most people didn't even realise that that was a problem. And yet, everybody in this room, 10 years later, a little over 10 years later, has one of these devices. But the other thing about disruption is that, so it solves problems, it solves big problems, it solves problems for lots of people, but it totally changes the way we do things. And there's heaps of examples of that, ranging from Uber, Amazon, um, Facebook, Instagram. Think of life without all these things and you get the gist. But the other interesting thing is that in most areas of digital technology disruption, the disruption has come from outside the industry being disrupted. Amazon did not run a bricks and mortar bookstore. Uber never ran a taxi company. And the examples can go on. So, these are change processes. Disruption is all about change. It's a really aggressive word, isn't it? Disrupt, rip, you know, rip. Uh, it's, it's a really nasty, it actually has a lot of negative connotation, disruption. But let's talk about change or disruption by mandate as opposed to by choice. I don't think this audience really needs a lot of explanation. We've all experienced the early attempts at EMR rollouts, yeah? The big teams of consultants, highly paid consultants, telling us how we're supposed to do our business as, cl as clinicians. Interestingly, these are different because generally they're trying to change us and we don't want to change. Why should I change? I was working perfectly fine yesterday. I don't see a problem with the way I'm practicing. And more importantly, the changes are not, we, we don't see the benefit of the change. Quite often, it's a bean counter, it's some um, uh, policy uh, person who's supervising the improvement in outcomes. We don't get to see the data of the improvement in patient care and safety and access to care and equity of care. So we're making all the change, but we don't see any of the benefit. Whereas when you're talking about disruption, nobody forced us to buy iPhones or, or Samsung Android devices or any other device like that. We want to do it. Why do we do it? Because it's easy. It's nice. Wow. This is a cool way of doing things. It just works. It makes sense. Anybody ever said that about an EMR? Not recently. But some parts of the EMRs are great, and lots of them aren't, and they're working to improve that. Trust me. <laughs> I'm a doctor. The, um, but you've got to get this app. What? You can still ring to get a taxi? You can, actually. And I'll tell you, the user interface is just as terrible as it always used to be. So what's the secret? What makes disruption work? I believe, from my, in my opinion, that, and this is opinion, um, there is some evidence behind this, but not in the sort that you generally have at scientific meetings such as this. It's about what's in it for me. You know, is it cheaper, less effort, quicker, better quality? Am I going to be seen as trendy or fashionable? Is it safer? Interestingly, you'll see all these sentences about for me. Is it cheaper for me? Not cheaper for the government. Is it less effort for me? Is it quicker? And don't, notice I've also put in there that sometimes things can be cheaper, you don't actually save any money. You spend the same amount of money and you get more product or you get a better quality product. But safer for me. I mean, if we were really motivated as doctors by safety, why on earth do we still not wash our hands? Every study shows that we're the worst offenders in washing our hands. So really, we're not motivated by the safety of our patients, we're motivated by our safety. Or is there something else at play? I might be being a bit simplistic there. But generally the driver for disruptive change is that things are better for me. Having said that, it's more than just the individual. You've got to make it better for everybody involved in the thing you're disrupting. So if you think of Uber, they made it better not just for the people catching uh, transportation devices, taxis in the old days, they made it better for the drivers. They allowed people who previously weren't able to provide a service driving people around to do it for almost no effort. 
Of course, the credit card companies were never going to be upset about a system that forced you to use a credit card to pay for the service. Uh, they, t they clip a ticket all the time anyway. But even though for good disruption, you need to make sure that all the players in the thing being disrupted get something back, get a, what, get a what's in it for me, get a with them, not everybody always is better off. And I, this quote in The Handmaid's Tale, I don't know how many watched that show, um, really resonated with me. Better never means better for everyone. It always means worse for some. And maybe as clinicians we don't like that thought, but I think it applies to most things that I can think of. And with digital disruption and digital change programs, it always seems to feel that we're the ones who get stuck with the worst, the worst usability with some of the, the centrally changed projects. I thought this morning David Pension did a fantastic uh, job of, of, a, of giving us an example of disruption. The John, the food catering manager in uh, QMC at the NHS, he listed all these wonderful winners. You know, the politicians were happy, the community was happy, the local farmers were happy, they, they got the unemployed off the unemployment ranks, the executives got to talk about how wonderfully empowering they are of their staff, the patients and staff got to eat great food, but there were still losers. Those old food outlets that were in the basement and reception area of their hospital probably weren't singing the praise of this, job, of this disruptive uh, event. The company that was trucking all the food in from wherever it was else in Europe, they've not only gone out of business potentially, or, or their drivers, the supply chain for them, the farmers that supplied their food, the energy suppliers, there are always losers in these disruptions. Before I go on to about the leadership disruption, my heading was who do we want to be in charge of our disruption as clinicians? Uh, I did want to talk briefly about how do we increase the chance of success. Not all of these disruptive technologies work, and there's a lot of people trying to be the next great unicorn, the next great idea that makes billions of dollars for them. Um, but increasingly, it's not just about good luck, about having that whiz kid, the Steve Jobs that can just see what people want and create solutions that we all love. He's dead now, so I hope it doesn't rely on people like that to produce all of the great ideas. And there is a science behind good design, the science of user or human-centered design. This is where we design things around the way humans operate, understanding the cognitive science that drives all human beings. Um, it's a, a, an increasingly developed science. It allows those of us who aren't gifted designers, like Johnny Eves or, or Steve Jobs as examples, uh, to achieve great results. And interestingly, it gets around the issues mentioned by Henry Ford. It gets around the issue of people asking for something because people generally don't know what they want. And it sounds a bit patronising or patriarchal, whatever, but it is interesting how people often can't describe the solution they have, they, sorry, the solution they need. What they can do is show you what they do every day. And through the study of human behaviour and, and human-centred design, you can work out where those pain points are and by, by targeted questioning and other processes, um, you can actually create solutions that actually solve the problem that people have um, without necessarily giving them what they asked for in the first place. Another factor in good human-centred design is it actually trains you to ask better questions about what exactly is your problem. You would not count the number of times I had vendors and um, doctors and clinicians coming to me saying, oh, I've got this great idea, it's going to solve all these problems. And, you know, like, this, you've just got to get this rolled out across New South Wales. And I said, well, okay, what problem are you trying to solve? And they were unable to tell me what problem it was actually solving. So spending more time, this is going to be a theme I bring back in the later slides, spending more time on being clear about what problem you're trying to solve is absolutely vital if you want one of these successful disruptions. The worst uh, cause of failed system is work as imagined. You take a bunch of well-meaning clinicians who work every day as a doctor or a nurse or whatever part they play in the hospital system, put them in a room and ask them, what are the requirements for your system? What are the functional specifications? What is the minimum data set? And, and like even better, you get an expert committee. You get all these hand-picked people that the politicians love and put them in a room and, you know, we're going to have a great solution. We've got the best people in the world all in this room that's going to be just sublime. And what they forget is that if I sat down and told you what I did, even as a CCIO, as an intensive care specialist every day, and you then followed me around and watched me do it, you'd think I was a lunatic. We are incredibly bad at describing what we do every day at the detail level required to design user interfaces and software. So it's absolutely key that human-centred design removes that completely. If you're doing good human-centred design, nobody is sitting in a room designing these pieces of equipment or tools or software package, whatever. So, but in the end, it doesn't matter how you do it. Um, if it's going to be um, a success, if it's going to be a disruptive success, it's got to be usable, 
It's got to be useful. I've seen great usable device, you know, apps that do nothing useful. Oh, great. Love the user interface. Gee, looks beautiful. Doesn't do anything of use to me. So it's got to be useful, and in our situation, it's got to be safe and of high quality. And then, of course, it has to be used. There is no point having this awesome tool that is really functional and really useful that nobody is using for whatever reason, uh, and preferably by choice uh, rather than by ma a mandate. So look, I get a lot of, uh, in, in my role as a CCIO, there are a lot of people fearful of disruption. You know, everybody heard the stories, Polaroid went out of business, the taxi companies are upset, blah, blah, blah. How do we stop ourselves being disrupted? Now, doctors do pretty well. You know, you've got a lot of control. Who else can be a physician? The RACP keeps a pretty tight grip on who's allowed to be a physician. Can't see that changing that quickly. But then Trump got voted in. There's a fair degree of unhappiness with the current service. There's not enough physicians, people say. They're in the wrong places. They never keep to their appointment schedule. Product, yeah, most people are happy, but then they don't know all the dark secrets that we know about all the things that go wrong, and that might change soon. There's a lot of really clever people who are looking very closely at what you do for their opportunities to disrupt you. The incentives are even changing. The governments are increasingly looking at paying you not for doing something, but for being successful, for having a successful patient outcome. And if you don't have a successful patient outcome, you don't get any money. There are people who are interested in paying you for a better patient experience, more satisfied patients, regardless of whether their treatment actually worked or not. There are people prepared to pay for healthy behaviour. And you could argue, well, that's the worst of all, because with all these people healthy, who's going to come and see doctors? I think we're a fair way off that. But the barriers are dropping in terms of incentive, financial incentive. The barriers are also dropping technically. The My Health Record, FIRE, uh, if you don't know these terms, uh, we can talk about them in the question and answer session. But these are technologies that are making it easier for interoperability, easier for systems to work together, easier for disruption. And the general public is increasingly saying, hey, I've got this device in my pocket all the time. This should really help me with healthcare. So there's a lot of drivers for you to be disrupted. So I wouldn't be too complacent. I think. Healthcare is reasonably safe, but then, about a year ago, I really didn't think I was going to see walking robots that could climb a hill covered with stones. And you don't have to look very far on the internet for a video of exactly that, just this week. They have this amazing, looks like a torso, legs, arms, walking up a hill in the bush, covered in rocks and stones and sticks, and not tripping over. That is pretty impressive, knowing the technology behind that. So, if we're going to get disrupted, who do we want to disrupt? Us, the patient, the government, payers, lawyers. Jen Morris had a great quote there. I'm not going to have somebody tell me whether I'm allowed to know your outcome data. I want to know whether you're a safe practitioner. And I don't care what you think about that. The nerds or us, the people who actually do healthcare. Us, and, and when I say us, I mean clinicians of all types. Uh, doctors, allied health practitioners, alternative practitioners, nurses, as well as the practice managers and the people that keep the engine running. But actually, I'm much more worried about the people we wouldn't even think of, because that's where most disruption has come from, people that you would never have thought of. If we leave it to the nerds, I went to lots of conversations and conferences where this was talked about. You know, we've got to replace the doctors with AI. Doctors are hopeless at making decisions. They're hopeless at looking at all the data. Computers are going to be much better at this. Maybe. I'd rather the AI worked on how we could make appointments more effectively so that people didn't spend as much time in waiting rooms. Robots replacing surgeons, well, nobody cares about surgeons, but increasingly physicians are procedural clinicians too, and the robots will probably replace you as well. Um, I personally believe there's a lot of value in the laying on of hands and the personal touch and the human contact, but you know everybody feels the video is going to replace face-to-face -face consultations. That will be interesting. Haven't seen it happen despite video conferencing being available for well over a decade. Um, they're replacing chatbots with automated systems. Uh, genomics will answer everything, um, and proteinomics if genomics doesn't fix it. Um, personalised medicine, wow, customised medicine titrated to the needs of the individual patient and their particular disease constellation and the medications they're on. I would never have thought of that. We need digital disruption to do that. I, I, I thought that's what we were taught to do in med school. But anyway, that, the IT nerds are saying, well, this is what we can do with, with, with big data and data analytics and, and customised experiences through the computers. Um, patient reported experience and outcome measures. This one's an interesting one because I feel the colleges have a particular role in defining appropriate outcome measures. And maybe it's the societies, not the colleges. In the intensive care world, ANZICS uh, came up with the... Um, 
uh, well, not the, we didn't come up with the Apache score, but we had the Australian modification of that. And we have reasonably good risk of death uh, prediction algorithms, which we could use to rate units against each other and, and potentially individuals against each other. Better than nothing. Um, most of the other specialties are not that advanced and don't have subspecialty level uh, granular method, methods of measuring what is a good outcome. How do you adjust for the fact that this practitioner sees 90-year-olds with five chronic intercurrent conditions, whereas that practitioner only ever sees people under the age of 30. Um, but trust me on this one, if you don't start doing it, other people will do it for you. And I don't suspect that that outcome is going to be as pleasant for us. The nerds are very good at making things smaller, making it carryable, making the battery life longer, converting your glucometer machine into something that's embedded inside you or you wear on you that gives continuous readings, connecting it to Wi-Fi. I'm pretty happy leaving that with them and, and it's generally done in partnership with clinicians, so I'm not too worried about being disrupted in, in that particular space, but it's certainly an area that all of the technology companies are looking at. How can we harness this massive volume of data we're going to be gaining off every individual in the planet? So what can you do to stay in charge? As I've said before, be really clear about what your problems are. Don't worry about the solutions. Somebody else will design them. Make sure you think about the rest of your team. It's not all about the doctor. There's other people in your office, in the hospital, that have to interact with the patient and play part in this. And if you don't create a solution that works with all of them, nobody will use that solution. Make sure everybody knows what these high priority areas are. I, I noticed that the RACP has a, an e-health reference group starting up. If you want to get involved in that, that's a great way of getting it on the agenda. And the RACP will be an organisation people listen to. Shape your materials to the audience. I noticed on your website you've got this thing called Evolve, which uh, looks like a, a sort of a, an evolution perhaps of uh, choosing wisely. Lovely. I'm an intensivist. I tried to find some best practice do not do's for various in areas that I'm interested in. Stroke, diabetes. It was a real bugger trying to find out what exactly I was supposed to do. You know, I'd, I'd search for a stroke and three different articles came up, one for pediatric, one for... Why, don't, why couldn't I just see a list of all the things you're telling us to do or not do in a nice curated form for a professional, let alone public who might want to see this as well. Really important when you're having things on the public internet to curate the message to the audience. And sure, who's going to go looking for Evolve if they aren't a physician already aware of the program? But uh, it's just something to be aware of when you are trying to influence the uh, executives and the government and other players who are not physicians to remember to use their language, not yours, and to structure things in their mindset, not yours, and be involved. Um, just coming to this session, thank you, uh, you're being involved. I wanted to uh, play a recording of something that bugs me. Am I allowed a couple more minutes? or I, you have, I haven't seen your sign, so I don't know where I'm at. Oh, I've got to finish. Do you want me, do you want me to stop? Okay, we've, we've, it's really cheating because we lost a speaker, so I can t I'm sure I can take a couple more minutes. You know, if you could just play um, recording number one. It's only a minute long. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people? When? Um, Today? Next Nine? Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we live here for like upper like uh, five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Yep. Bye bye. Now, I'm sorry it's not a clinical example, but you can easily see that relating to somebody trying to make a booking for one of your practices. How many people in this room have heard that exact recording? Okay, there's enough of you, but just don't be involved in the next bit then. Um, because I think uh, that minute is wasted thousands and thousands and thousands of times in practices all over the world. And I really think we should be focusing on doing something to improve the patient experience of, of getting appointments made with us, getting our referral documents here, um, and uh, ensuring that clinicians are actually available when their appointment time comes up and we don't have to wait an hour in their practice waiting room, etc. But that particular recording is interesting because um, how many people in this room think that that was a conversation between two human beings? Now, it's a bit of a cheat. I'm on a talk about disruption and technology, so it's probably a loaded question. But it's good to see a few hands up there. That was actually in between uh, a computer and... Um, 
a machine, um, sorry, a computer and a human. Uh, the Asian lady with the very difficult to understand accent was actually the human. That's probably not hard to understand. Um, if we had more time and maybe later I can play you recording number three where they're two um, uh, adult um, uh, American speaking English, native English speakers and I played it to my family members and half the family members picked the wrong person as the human. That's how good our voice recognition and speech technologies are today. And they're not even trying to do anything really exciting. So it fascinated me because in the space I'm in, in, in digital technology companies and eHealth New South Wales, we're trying to work out all these ways of standardizing the, the format of the message so that you can go from your app in the iPhone and it goes into your EMR and then it comes out to your practice management system and back to the My Health record and, and everybody's got to agree on the format. Google are just saying, we don't care. Just put us on the phone with the person. We'll make the appointment. That the example there was triggered by somebody with their um, uh, Android device just saying to the Android device, please book me a table on the 7th of March for four people at this particular restaurant. Then the computer goes away and rings the restaurant and has that entire conversation without the human involved at all. Now you think how that could be applied to your practice in um, the next few months or years. I'll wrap up on that. There's, oh sorry, there we go. Um, the uh, the, the other slide was there as a, a backup if I took too little time, which never happens. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen. I hope I've stimulated a few questions. Remember the app, the front page of the app once you download it, bottom row, middle button is an ask a question uh, button. So you can type in any question you'd like and we'll try and answer it if, if uh, Nick will let us see the exciting questions. Um, and look, I, I can't help remind you that, uh, I mean David Pension, I'll quote him again, use your collective voice. The physician community is a very powerful community, but I'd like you to be the disruptors, or at least on the winning side of disruption, not the losers. And in the four years that I was in eHealth New South Wales, I saw a lot of technology companies trying to cut you out of the equation completely. So let's try not to let that happen. Thank you. <laughs>